Hi, good to see you and thanks for coming. Um, engineering food structures for better functionality. That's the subject up there. Um, I will just say a few words about what food structure engineering is all about, or at least how I interpret what it's all about, and then tell you a few short stories um, about some concerns or some projects that have been done, are undergoing, or at least sort of will be undergoing for some time and point towards the future. So I'll say a bit about camels. Not a whole lot, but a little bit. A bit about ingredients in fermented milk products. A bit about proteins and satiety as uh, Bjarke has already been touching upon. I won't say a whole lot, but just a bit. And something about nanotubular structures from milk protein and end up with uh, a little bit about our experiences with working with cheese powder without melting salt. And then, of course, try and put it into some sort of conclusion and perspectives. This is what we try and do. We try and sort of span the whole yeah, gap, you can say, or the gaps, all the way from sort of understanding the molecular interactions. And then the influence of processing. I mean, Colin has already touched upon those aspects. We're, of course, interested in how you can say ingredients and other stuff interacts with the matrix in order to generate yeah, structure and texture and the consequences of that. And of course, how that, in the end, relates to the final sort of food macroscopic quality, including the sensory aspects. Um, and to do that, you need people not just us, because we can't know everything. Of course we can't. Uh, uh, so one of the things that we have to tackle is that we know maybe some sort of, have some core techniques, and we have some stuff that we really think that we can, you know, really do and do very well. That's the stuff down here. We can do rheology, microstructure, limit analysis, particle sizing, CETA potential measurements, and we really try and do understand the functional properties and how to create model systems so we can look at functional properties in general. That's all of our core competences, but we need to interact with people who have other techniques available in order to get a good full understanding. People who know much more than we do and have techniques available to look into the molecular interactions. Uh, and of course we also need to interact with people who know about the final food quality in other ways than we do. For example, the sensory group uh, here within our department. So, up there, it says some sort of key words here. Cross-disciplinary, international, industry involvement, yeah, basic as well as applied, and balancing the <laughs> dichotomy, sorry, uh, uh, because that is really sort of important, the dialogue between the basic and the applied. And that's one of the things that I, yeah, it concerns me, I think, more and more. And I become more and more aware of some of the complexities, but also you can say some of the advantages of trying to strike that balance in what we do. Some of my projects are actually extremely applied. Some of the projects I deal with are much more basic, and some of the people I deal with are doing much more basic stuff as well. So what I'm trying to do is sort of stand up there in the middle and try and facilitate a little bit what goes on and understand, of course, some of the basic and some of the applied. Some of the agendas that the industry has, as well as the uh, uh, sort of agenda uh, uh, that the sort of the basic scientist has. So, balancing that particular uh, problem, or you can say the aspects of the basic and applied science, is really a challenge. I think it's not just in our particular world and what I do with, with food structure engineering. I think it's a very general aspect of food science. Uh, so in some ways, doing rocket science or more basic studies are in some ways simpler because you can focus more on some aspects. But here, we have always to think about, in the end, of course, the consumer that we have to deal with. This is actually balancing that particular dichotomy between the applied and the basic in practice. Um, thanks, Lulu, for the picture. So our focus areas. Uh, when we look at sort of food structuring is of course sort of the interaction of milk protein ingredients and again during the processing as well with the other parts of the matrix that we have available. What happens if you add a given ingredient uh, uh, into a sort of milk matrix and milk is really really complex of course. Um, and how do we then also perhaps utilize proteins from other sources, vegetable proteins for example. So sustainable products, functional products is very much part of our agenda. Satiety control is one aspect of the functionality. But basically also understanding dairy powder functionality. 
It's something that we really want to have a more further focus on. We've been looking quite a bit at, at, at sort of cheese powder functionality, but we also would like to work more in clarifying some of the more fundamental aspects of, uh, of recombination, for example. I don't think we know enough about dairy powders, and Colin touched upon why this is actually important. We've used enzymes quite a bit for dairy ingredient functionality and how it can influence and improve the functionality. Uh, proteases is one aspect that I'll sort of come back to and phospholipases is another that we've dealt with. Um, and making sense of images. We tried initially just, you know, we take an image and then we look at it and then we trust or believe what we're seeing. We're scientists, for Christ's sake. Uh, uh, a lot of stuff when you look at it in literature says, well, we have an image here and we can clearly see. Yeah, how do you qualify that? How do you quantify it? So we are lucky enough to sort of work with people here, especially within our own department actually, who have a knowledge about image treatment and extracting data uh, from images and actually then trying to quantify the information you get in images. That's a sort of another of my concerns uh, more and more to actually sort of try and make sense of images and not just, you know, just look at them and see what you see. Understanding reactions between food proteins uh, uh, and other ingredients, especially carbohydrates, is another aspect that we are dealing with. Um, I've also sort of in recent years been slightly involved in looking at cleaning in place in the dairy industry. We don't know enough about cleaning. It's not a very sexy subject, but it's damned important. Um, and then of course this aspect of the camels, looking at non-bovine milk. I think basically we can learn a lot about bovine milk and about milk in general by looking at milk from non-bovine species. We know an enormous amount, and it's still very complex, and there's still lots of stuff we don't know about bovine milk. But for example, camel milk that we have been working with is really, really a challenge, because there's a lot of stuff that we don't really know about. So, I'll just make some, yeah, a few focus points here. I'll talk a bit about functional products, a bit about this cheese powder functionality, about the proteases a bit, and then this milk protein EPS interactions. Uh, and the non-bovine milk, the camels. And I'll start out with the camels. We have a collaborative project with Haumara University. The project is financed by Danita. Uh, it's a collaboration that also involves uh, the Danish Technical University and Egan I saw around coming in, uh, which is good. Egan is actually the project manager here. Uh, but what we are trying to understand is that we have a number of known differences uh, uh, in camel milk when we compare it with bovine milk. They have larger casein micelles, there's less kappa casein. Uh, there are some major differences in the way protein composition. Colin showed you an image of this, yeah, the villain, or the beta lactoglobulin, at least, that is in, uh, in milk. Uh, it's not present in camel milk, and that provides very different properties in general. So the technology, of course, has to be modified if we want to make products that sort of are similar or of the similar type as we do when we are using bovine milk. And just a few examples. Um, if you do renetting, if you want to make cheese uh, out of camel milk, that is really a challenge. But one of the things that helps is actually using the enzyme, the rennet enzyme of the chymosin, that comes from the camel. Uh, and Christian Hansen has actually been able to produce this particular enzyme, and using that more specific enzyme in camel milk actually provides a major advantage. As does, of course, increasing temperature and concentration in slightly different ways than what we normally know also from, from bovine milk. Uh, another aspect is actually growing commercial starter cultures that are normally sort of optimized, of course, for bovine milk, and trying to use them in camel milk. They grow differently. As you can see up there, um, there's just some data on the growth in, in cow's milk for a given culture. It works really nicely. And then if you have camel milk, uh, it's actually sort of very different if you look at it, and the camel and, and the mix of camel milk. Um, so. This is probably due to the reduced availability of the nutrients. Uh, and that could mean that the uh, sort of the proteolytic system uh, of the lab cultures is less efficient if you look at the camel milk compared to the bovine milk. So that is one of the aspects that we have to deal with as well. Starter cultures react differently in cow's milk and in camel's milk. Just one aspect. I mean, we are trying to do more, and we are trying to sort of aid the people in, uh, in, in Haramaya to sort of get more knowledge, uh, fundamental knowledge about the camel milk, and then again have this more applied aspect as well. So we are trying from a more fundamental understanding to end up with something that can be applied under the conditions in Ethiopia. Another focus that I've had for quite some time uh, is, you can say, ingredients in fermented milk products. 
Exopolysaccharides is one aspect, um, and we do know that they differ quite a lot. Uh, exopolysaccharides are being produced by, by lactic acid bacteria during the fermentation. It's like having an in situ production of, starter, uh, of stabilizers uh, within the yogurt. Uh, um, instead of sort of adding something, you have the bacteria doing it for you. Um, but of course, bacteria differ a lot. I'm sometimes pretty happy that I'm not a microbiologist. Uh, because there are lots of strain to strain variations within these EPS producing cultures. And of course they interact with the other ingredients we've looked into, uh, add into a, a yogurt system, milk proteins for example, in order to improve the texture and the consistency, we add different types of milk proteins into uh, uh, these types of, of systems as well. And they interact. Uh, the bacteria and the EPS differently, of course, depending on what conditions we have in the system. So together with Christian Hansen, with Isla Foods, Isla Food Ingredients, uh, we've done a number of projects. Uh, the last two ones here that I will present some results from have been done in collaboration with, uh, with the Inspire, onto the uh, or species of the Inspire research platform. This is what it means if you look at sort of just the macroscopic stuff, right? It basically means that if you do it without EPS, then you're not really getting a lot of coherence in your sort of product when you put a stir in there and draw it up again. And here you're seeing much more of this ropey structure or texture as we call it. It's not necessarily wanted in all types of products, but it can provide more texture, more creaminess in these types of products when we have EPS present. So we've been looking at them. And this again might not be an image that you can make sense of. Um, we've tried to make sense of images like this. Um, what you are looking at is basically that all the blue stuff up there this is the protein part of it, and there's protein all over. That's the protein in the, in the, uh, in the yogurt gel. Uh, and then these green and red dots are different types of EPS that we have been visualizing with the aid of lectins that have a flow for attached, and then they attach to the EPS, and then we get a signal. And that means that we can actually go in there and sort of to a certain degree, you can say quantify uh, the effect of the EPS and the amount of EPS in the system. Uh, so that's where we have sort of been collaborating with people who do image analysis to try and see what we can do uh, with these types of, of images that we uh, generate from such studies. Uh, and this is some unpublished work from, uh, from uh, Patricia Boulder, who is now at Christian Hansen, but who was a postdoc uh, with us until the 1st of October. Um, we've used a number of different commercial starter cultures. One low in EPS production, two there that are high in EPS production, and then we've added different ingredients. This is the control, just skim milk powder, and these are different types of whey protein. These are commercial ingredients. Whoops. One of the challenges of balancing is that you are getting commercial ingredients from companies and they not always tell you everything about what's in there. Uh, they're nodding up there at the back row uh, from Isla Food Ingredients <laughs> or Isla Foods. They know the issue. Uh, I th still think you can learn quite a bit from, from looking at how different sort of products actually react. And of course you can know more if you're actually Isle of Food Ingredients who know the precise details of what's in there. Uh, but we can of course make some sort of ideas about what goes on. But my main message here today is basically that the EPS is the green stuff, the protein is the red here, but you can see that there's a difference in the structure perhaps. Again, we haven't quantified it here, we've done it in other studies. Uh, but the difference also relates to the ingredient that has been added into the system. There's an interplay between the EPS and the whey protein ingredients and the composition of the whey protein ingredients. And that's the major issue. Those two sort of major components or ingredients here really interact. And that's what we are trying to understand more in detail. One of the other macroscopic consequences is that we get different degrees of graininess depending on what EPS and what whey protein we have present. Uh, there's an ongoing discussion whether the culprit is the EPS or the whey protein or whatever is going on in, in, in these sort of startup systems. Uh, but undoubtedly, again, the composition of the whey protein ingredient and, for that matter, of the EPS uh, does play a role. If you look at these sort of figures here, we have a given whey protein and these are three different types of cultures. And you can see that one of them actually interacts and produces a lot of grains, the others do not. This one produces grains more or less irrespective of the culture, this particular whey protein ingredient. So again, there's an interaction going on that produces different amount of grains. And graininess can be an issue in, uh, in quite a number uh, of, of yogurt type products. It's something, of course, that the industry wants to avoid. We don't really like it as consumers. So what do we then try and do? Again, the dance, the dichotomy between the applied and the basic, 
In order to get an angle on what is going on, we do this more applied stuff and see, yes, there is an interaction. Um, and then in order to perhaps try and get closer to what precisely is going on, we can then maybe do more simplified systems and then use some more, you can say, advanced techniques in order to understand a little bit more. So we've been collaborating with DTU, uh, the Department of Systems Biology and, and Beata Svensson, uh, who uses, for example, surface plasma resonance to look directly at interactions. So you can sort of you mobilize the protein on a chip, and then you can sort of have your EPS circulating under different conditions, change the pH, for example, uh, and then you're actually able to sort of quantify that interaction that goes on and how it depends on pH between a given milk protein and a given EPS. The challenge is often to get EPS, to get it well characterized, to get it out of the milk, to believe that this is the same stuff as the bacteria actually then do produce when they're in the milk. So there's a lot of complications in it, but still, it does provide us some insight. And for example, just to highlight a few things here, uh, that we can see that if we have certain types of linkages in the systems, well, we are seeing that we get higher binding affinity, at least uh, for the ones we have investigated, when there's an alpha-1-4 linkage rather than an alpha-1-3. That's the dominating linkage in this. Here we use some very well-defined EPS structures to look at. Um, and we can see that for capacation, which is sort of on the outside of the of the case in my cells, that if we have a lot of these alpha-1-6 uh, linkages, that we actually have the highest binding affinity. Uh, but maybe not so good if we're looking at the native beta natural droglin, which of course is also present in the milk. So this is just a point that we are trying to explore. And at the moment, we have the HexPin project, uh, which is a project that at DTU and, and with Peter Swenson as, as the project manager, uh, that also involves DTU chemistry and nanotech, and Christian Hansen is there as well, in order to sort of look more into these basic uh, uh, sort of aspects of the interaction between the milk proteins and the EPS. It's a model system, it's simplified. But what we learned from that, we can then take and sort of put into more real life situations and see, well, does it hold? Do the trends we see from the model systems then actually apply when we take these systems and then make them more at pilot scale uh, level and look at the macroscopic consequences here? Proteins, processing and satiety is another aspect, another big project that we have uh, got through and funded by the Danish Council for Strategic Research. We call it Struxat. Our main idea was we want to see how food structure affects satiety. Lots of partners involved here, two industries, DuPont Nutrition Biosciences and Isle of Food Ingredients, proteins and alginates, for example, uh, and a couple of universities and some external partners from outside Denmark involved in this particular project. We are again trying to span all the way from the molecular interactions to the consumer in the end, to the nutritional aspects here. Not enough is known, for example, when you do nutritional studies, what has this protein preparation you are providing been subjected to in terms of processing? And that's one of the aspects we really want to look into. But we also want to go all the way back to the molecular interactions and trying and see how they influence the structure, of course, and, and the aggregates that we can produce, and then how these aggregates, either protein-protein aggregates or protein-alginate aggregates, how they then actually react in mice and in humans. There should maybe be an arrow here as well. Now, we don't know precisely how well we can, you know, uh, predict stuff from looking at mice, but one of the advantages of mice is that you can actually sacrifice them. And then you can look at what the physiological changes are uh, that have been induced by inducing differences in the processing of the proteins and hence in the structure. And again, playing around with the molecular dynamics of the whole system. So that's the overall idea of the Struxet project. Um, come back in four years, uh, and I will try and give you a little bit of a, of a more sort of overview of what results we obtained. Uh, here I will just sort of give you a little bit of an idea. This is not from mice, it's not from humans. This is from the lab, this is in vitro, simulated gastric digestion. Um, and it's basically what we call a serum protein concentrate, so it's made from milk and just contains the, the whey proteins, and plus minus alginate in the system. And the one up here is just the, uh, the serum protein concentrate. And then once you start adding alginate, or you then decrease the pH uh, in order to get coercivation, meaning you get reactions between the alginate and the protein, you're actually decreasing digestibility. You can also see that there might be some slight differences between the high molecular weight and the low molecular weight alginate. So we are playing around with the protein, but also with the protein sort of interaction 
uh, in the system to try and see if we can influence the rate of digestion. And of course, in the end, we hope that this is something that we can then see repeated or more investigate more in detail when we feed it to the mice and in the end to the humans. Uh, so in our case, structure basically means structure of protein alginates or structure of uh, 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 sort of protein alginate aggregates. Uh, so we have tried to sort of had to limit ourselves. We can't use sort of all sorts of different types of food structures. We needed to have something that was well defined and had the same calorific uh, content, of course. About, what, more than 15 years ago, we stumbled upon a system where we could make nanotubes from alpha-lactalbumin. This is one of the more, you can say, basic type systems that, uh, it, it came from looking at meltability of mozzarella cheese. It came from a very applied study, uh, where we were trying to improve the meltability of mozzarella cheese that had incorporated the whey protein. So we were trying to digest whey protein in mozzarella cheese, um, and we stumbled over this enzyme from, from Novozymes uh, that was actually able to create, in the end, we discovered nanotubular structures from alpha lactalbumin. And I've tried to make people interested in this, especially at, at Isla Food Ingredients, but it doesn't have a lot of, well, they say it's scientifically interesting, but they don't really believe that they can make money from it right now. Um, so we are trying to sort of move it perhaps a bit so we can maybe, you know, uh, get some more application-oriented uh, uh, sort of strategies for looking at this particular system. Uh, I can imagine quite a few things that you can incorporate into uh, the tubes uh, and then release them. Uh, but we can play around with calcium, for example and get tubes, we can leave out the calcium uh, and do more of the hydrolysis and then we get linear fibrils instead. We can play around with different structures and mixes up the structures. Um, and one of the things we have seen with a, you can say, more commercial preparation of alpha lactalbumin, we purify this ourselves from a commercial preparation. And if you hydro hydrolyze the stuff at 7.5, in this case, you don't really see a gel. If you decrease the pH, then you're actually seeing gelation occurring here uh, at different times. Uh, but then you can sort of play around a bit because the hydrolysis is faster at 7.5. That's why quite a lot of the studies we did originally were done at 7.5. Um, but you can then sort of init initially just sort of do uh, uh, the, the 7.5 uh, pH in, in terms of the hydrolysis. You get a rapid hydrolysis and then you can sort of just do changes in the pH and you're seeing more or less a rapid gelation. And this gelation just, show just shows that we are getting these structures being formed, nanotubular structures and sometimes mixes of nanotubular structures uh, with fibrils as well. Finally, some, I would say, rather applied stuff, but that still has a lot of scientific interest. It's probably the most difficult system that I've ever tried to work with, cheese powder. Uh, because not only do you have the sort of whole aspect of having the powder production, making the feed and doing the powder, you also have all these differences in the cheeses uh, uh, that you have to then apply into the system. Your raw material is extremely variable. One of the things that we can see and that uh, Lactosan, who's the company producing cheese powder, can see is that there would actually, as a market appearing, that would like it decrease uh, uh, in, in the uh, uh, addition of melting salts. Uh, so we applied for the GUDP uh, to get funding for trying to sort of see whether cheese powder could be made without or with reduced addition of melting salts. Melting salts are basically uh, uh, sort of sodium phosphates uh, and they sort of dissolve the cheese to a certain extent. So you get like a, you can say a thin processed cheese slurry that you then put on your spray drying tower. Um, and what, we, what they basically do is they do a really nice emulsification and make a more homogeneous uh, feed in the system uh, by binding the calcium, uh, among other things. Uh, and if we just look at some pictures here of some recent pictures of the actual powders, this is a powder all the way to the end that has been made without uh, uh, the addition of, uh, of melting salt. And this is one that has been made when uh, melting salts has actually been added. And you can see here that the red stuff, which is the fat, more or less sort of glues the particles together here and you can see quite a lot of free fat existing outside the sort of more proteinaceous uh, uh, cheese powder particles. Uh, whereas here they're nicely sort of incorporated. And that's what melting salts actually do. So that's what we have to try and sort of make without this particular addition of the melting salts. So we've tried a number of different strategies, adding other ingredients, for example, buttermilk powder, sodium caseinate. We vary the age of the cheese to see what is actually the optimum cheese age. 
We've used different combinations of cheeses uh, and look very much at what we call the recipe construction. What are the primary cheeses and what cheeses can maybe be added to aid uh, uh, in this particular production without the melting salts. Um, and we've looked at variation in processing parameters, mechanical treatment, mixing time and mixing speed, for example, and also just the adjustment of the pH itself by other means than, than having the melting salts present. And it's actually possible to produce cheese powders. They do it now at Lactosan uh, without uh, having addition of, of the melting salts. Uh, but as I just showed you, the feeds uh, and the powders in the end are very different. Uh, so it does provide problems as well. We haven't totally solved the, uh, the issue that we started out with. We've created new knowledge, yes. Um, and we have some sort of ideas that we need to combine a number of strategies in order to be able to be successful here. There's not one shot here that works. We need to be able to combine stuff in order to reach the goal. Um, one of the things that Lactosan is somewhat happy about is actually that cheese powders without melting salts, there is a possibility for, you can say, novel markets because the taste and the actual sort of functionality is also consequently changed. And that could be an advantage in a number of different types of products. So one of the good things about this particular aspect uh, working and one of the things about working with more applied stuff uh, that has really been, been a good thing for me is to work very closely to the production. Lactosan is a small company uh, and we actually have people from the production present at the project meetings and we get the insights all the way from people working with the processes and then we can sort of provide a bit of input from the research that we have done and we can have that dialogue. And that is one of the things I really enjoy and one of the things that I do try again to keep that balance. Uh, between the basic and the applied. Uh, there's a lot of stuff to be learned as well from cheese powder, but there's also quite a lot of stuff to be learned from interacting with people who are working uh, on a daily basis with the real type problems. So, my final conclusions here. Foods appear deceptively simple, but are very complex uh, multi-phase and meter-stable systems. I think you all know that. Um, and this makes food science challenging. It also makes it fun since a balance between the basic and the applied always have to be achieved. So that's what I've been yeah, discussing the whole half hour here. Uh, industrial collaboration provides unique opportunities for research but requires mutual trust. I think all of you from industry knows that and I think those of us from, from the Department of Food Science know as, knows that as well. I think it's important that we maintain that. We need scientists from very diverse fields to provide input for food related problems in order to develop our insight and understanding. Yeah, that at least is a very basic experience that I've had, but I think I'm not the only one. Modern systems are useful, but not the whole truth. They need to be complemented with more real life systems and that's where we as food scientists again can be very practical sort of facilitators in the dialogue. One technique is never enough. Don't trust just one technique. I think you all know that. But again, it's sort of a very basic uh, thing to state. And we need more and better techniques, always, always and forever. Uh, and the European spallation source that comes up in Lund, uh, where we can get sort of uh, both x-rays and neutrons for doing scattering studies, will actually give us rather unique opportunities uh, to understand more about the structures that we have in different types of foodstuffs. And hopefully we can be able to do more or less sort of inline processing as well uh, on some of these sort of sources of, of neutrons and, and x-rays. And finally, of course, thank you uh, to all my former and present students, BHC, MSc, and most of all, of course, the PhDs, all former and present postdocs as well, all my colleagues over the years, all my industrial collaborators, all my university partners in Denmark and abroad, all university administrators and management. Why do you laugh? <laughs> all the funding agencies. I mean, university administrators and management actually does try and help. I'm not thanking the politicians here, as you might see. Um, and what university management and administrators often do is try and manage impossible yeah, decisions. Anyway, all the funding agencies as well, of course. And what I want to thank for is all the hard work and enthusiasm and making this journey that I've been on possible and all the discussions about the shared insights and the shared insights that we have gained doing all that. And of course, for allowing me to have fun at work. Not just now, but uh, in the past and hopefully also in the future. And of course, thank you for all your attention and being here.